Most gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of mercy. We thank you that you are a God who waits and cherishes us. Lord, we ask that eyes and hearts and ears would be open to see your hand, to hear your word, to receive and embrace it. Holy Spirit, touch the lives and the hearts of those who are here. We pray these things in the precious name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. I'm not going to belabor the point, but I think we've all heard the expression or at least have thought these thoughts at one time or another. Bad things happen to bad people. Isn't that true? You've heard that line before, haven't you? And sometimes bad things happen to good people, and that's something that we have a hard time with, isn't it? I mean, the news today and yesterday and last week and for the several months, we hear about tragedies and how good people are harmed or killed because of some senseless person. Isn't that true? I mean, we can't go a day, it seems, without hearing something like that. In a way, our gospel kind of focuses on something like that because Jesus is confronted by some of the Jews that are around him, some of the people that are around him, and saying, well, what about the Israelites that were killed by Pilate? Pilate's notorious. Pilate does not like the Jewish people. Pilate does not like revolts that come up. Pilate doesn't, he could care less about them. And so what happened was that there was somewhat of an uprising because Pilate had brought in these signets or these standards, these emblems of Caesar who thought he was God and paraded them through Jerusalem. And it was an affront to the Jewish people. It was like, why are you bringing these things in? And so there was kind of a skirmish and uprising and a rebellion in some ways. And he just was always, they always just really kind of rebelled against Pilate. So as they were coming for a feast, the Galileans were coming in and coming to Jerusalem. He dressed some of his finest soldiers in civilian clothes to make them look like they were Jewish people. They had concealed weapons, and while they were offering their sacrifices to God, he had them kill them and mix their blood in the temple, which desecrated the temple at the time. Pilate wasn't a good guy in anybody's book. But Jesus has asked the question, well, why did this happen? Was it because they were worse sinners than anybody else and they deserved it? Jesus said no. Second thing was that Pilate had gone in and he had obscured with some of the funds in the temple itself and taken their money so that he could build an aqueduct. And those that were working on it, the aqueduct fell and killed them. Were they worse sinners than anybody else? The answer is no, because what Jesus is pointing out is that we're all sinners. You and me and everybody else. We're not immune to it. But not that we're worse than anybody else. We can't judge each other, but it's God who judges us. Remember in Romans, Paul reminds us that we all fall short of the glory of God. Isn't that true? I mean, in our worship time, if we're not worshiping God with our true heart and we're just here, then we're all sinners. We're all sinners. From We all fall short. We fall short of our worship of Him. We fall short of our praise for Him. We fall short in what we should do. The wages of sin is death, but God desires not for us to perish. And really, that is what this message is about today. It's not about anything else except for God's mercy. It's not anything else but about God's love for you. So here's your question of the day. How much does God love you? Y'all believe that God loves you? I don't see hands raised. How many of you believe that God loves you? All right. But I want to tell you that He does. Whether you think so or not, He does. Let me read you a passage from Nehemiah. And I think when you see this, you'll realize how much God loves you. 
and how much he cares for you. Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning at the 26th verse. If you have a Bible, you can look it up. There's one in the pew if you're really curious. Nevertheless, and he's talking about the Israelites, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you and they committed great blasphemies. Now that's a really great description of the Israelites, isn't it? I mean, you can see how bad they were. They were disobedient, they rebelled, they cast your law away, they killed the prophets... But the prophets were there to warn them to come back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore you gave them into the hands of your enemy who made them suffer. In other words, God removed his hand. He didn't stick them there. He removed his hand. It's like you walk away. He walked away. He said, you guys want to be rebellious? Go ahead, be rebellious. But I'm not going to be with you while you're rebelling. You want me? Call for me. But until then, you're on your own. And that's true. When we walk away from God, if we, don't, if we walk away from Him, we're on our own. But as our colleague said, we are unable, unable to do anything for ourselves. We have to have God. Therefore, He gave them into the hands of your enemy who made them suffer. And, now listen to this. When do you call out to God? Every day? I'm glad. But a lot of people don't call out to him until when? When they're in trouble. Isn't that true? Oh, God, help me out of this mess. Oh, God, help me. And what's God saying? Well, how'd you get there? It wasn't by me. How'd you get there? Well, God, you know I... Yeah, but how'd you get there? You see, God is a God of mercy. God is a God of grace. And he says, in their time of trouble, he goes on to say, in their time of suffering, they cried out to you, and you heard them from heaven. Isn't that a comforting thought? When we cry out to God, he hears us. He hears us from the heavens. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors and saved them from the land of the hand of their enemies. You see, when God comes into our lives, He delivers us from what we are in peril for. Our reading in 1 Corinthians says, He will deliver us. He will take care of us. But we have to come to Him. It's when we follow and focus on Him that He's there. But again, the Israelites were recalcitrant. But after they had rest... They did evil again before you, and you abandoned them to the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. Yet, here we go again. You'd think they'd learn by now, don't you? You'd think we would learn by now, don't you? And he goes, Yet, when they turned and cried to you, you left them alone and disowned them. No, that's not in there, okay? <laughs> Yet you heard them, and many times, did you catch that word? Many times. Many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Isn't that what God is about? God is about loving us enough that in our own way, and when we fall away and we come back to Him, He's loving enough to bring us back into His fold, to hold us close to Him, to deliver us from whatever we've fallen away from, or why we've fallen away. You see, He's a God of mercy, a God of grace. And that's what Lent really reminds us about, is about that great mercy of God. It's about how much He loves us. You see, Jesus was in Jerusalem, and they were asking Him, well, these people were really bad, so maybe they deserved it. And Jesus said, no, you're just as bad as they are, because when you fall away from God, you're as much of a sinner as they are. But God does not desire us to die. He desires us not to perish, but have everlasting life with Him. That's how much He loves us. 
So we can't point our fingers at somebody and say, well, they're worse than me. No, because we all fall short. But He's a God that no matter where you've been or what you've done, He is there for you. When you cry out to Him, He answers from the heavens. But it takes the heart to be molded. It takes the heart to open up and trust in Him that He does. Trust in Him that He cares for you. When we think about Moses in our Old Testament reading, how many of y'all know who Moses is? Okay, come on. Thank you. <laughs> Moses was actually, he was Jewish. Okay? But how was he raised? Do you ever think about that? How was Moses raised? It was the Pharaoh's daughter who found him. It was Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him. It was Pharaoh's daughter who took him home. It was Pharaoh's daughter who fed him. And in that, he was raised as an Egyptian. He dressed, wasn't there a song, dressed like an Egyptian or something like that? I'm not going to go into that. But, oh, walk like an Egyptian. Well, he probably did. But Pharaoh was well clothed. Pharaoh, uh, uh, Moses, was raised and clothed and fed and educated in Pharaoh's house. He had a nice life. And yet, when he saw the Israelites being abused, he came up to one of the Egyptians who was over them and guarding them, and he killed them, and he went on the lamb. And he went to Midian. All of a sudden, here's Moses, and now he's on the lamb. And yet, God uses him. For 40 years, he was with his father-in-law, He'd married, and he was tending sheep. And as sheep herders do, they have to move from pasture to pasture. Isn't that true? And otherwise, the land gets barren. It doesn't replenish. And what happens for him is that God approaches him. And on Mount Horeb, we hear about the burning bush and God's presence. And he says, take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground. It was out of respect. But I think Moses didn't think he could be used by God. But each one of us can be used by God. No matter what our past is, we have to have trust. Moses says, you want me to go where? I can't go there. In fact, Moses, if we, if we continued on with this through the readings, you find he gives five different excuses why he can't go. How many of you ever given an excuse to God why you can't do ministry? Come on. We all have. Be honest. We did confession. We can do it again. But here's the point. Moses is before God, and God says, I'm going to send you back. Now, he's sending them not back to Pharaoh. Well, he does send them to Pharaoh to say, let my people go, and to have him try to get let the Israelites go. But Pharaoh's all about the money and about cheap labor, so he's not going to do that. But Moses has to go to the Israelites. Now, the Israelites knew him as an, being dressed and raised by Egyptians. Now, if somebody came up to your door and said, I've got something to tell you, and I want you to believe this, and I want you to do this, would you believe them? I remember door-to-door -door salesmen, don't you? And this is the best product you'll ever get. This is why it is. But do they have the credentials to tell you something? Do they really have the credentials? And that's what the Israelites wanted to make sure. Moses, you're raised an Egyptian. Moses, you're over in Midian. Moses, you're coming back. Why should we trust you to say that God's going to deliver you and take you out of here? Why should we trust you? That was Moses' question to God. What kind of credentials am I going to have? How are they going to know that you really sent me? 
And Moses, and God goes on with Moses and says, Tell them, I am sent me. I am. And then he goes on to say, I am who I am. In other words, I will be who I will be. We cannot define God. He's going to be who he's going to be. And if you think about it, we too cannot define God. We want to try sometimes, but we can't define him. But the only thing we can define is some of his character. We're aware of his character. He's Jehovah Shalom. God of peace. Jehovah Sidkenu, my righteousness. Jehovah Rafi, my healer. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Jehovah Nisi, my banner that's over me. There's even more names for him than that, but it doesn't define him. It only defines part of his character. I am who I am, and send me. Tell them, I send you because of the promises I made to your forefathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And that name shall last forever. Because they knew the history of Abraham. They knew the promises that they would have the promised land. They knew about Isaac. They knew about Jacob. It gives Moses those credentials to say that. But more importantly, it's about God hearing the cry of his people and coming to them because their hearts were repentant. They were suffering. And they realized that they needed to turn back to him. And that's what Jesus is saying to all those who are in Jerusalem. Repent. Turn back. I don't think there's any difference between the Israelites at that time, the Jews that were in Jerusalem at that time, and us. Because when we really realize, we have to examine our hearts each and every day. We have to examine our hearts. Am I really truly serving God? Am I truly really worshiping Him? Am I truly really praising Him for who He is? The foundations in which were set thousands of years ago are the sure foundations that we have today. He's a God of mercy, a God of grace, a God who desires not to see us perish. In Peter's epistle, you hear about God's love for us, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Hold on to this in your heart. The Lord is not slow about His promises, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. That's what Jesus was telling them. Come to repentance. Turn your hearts back to God. That's what it's about. In our Lenten season, is God changing your heart and how you worship Him, how you trust Him, how you see Him, how He intervenes in your life and how He loves you? That's what this is about. It's about God's gracious love for you as they wrote about in Nehemiah. He said, many times God showed his mercy. The parable of the vineyard owner coming and finding the tree fruitless is about those who don't serve or love God. But yet Jesus intervenes for us. He's the mediator between us and God. And he says, let me work. Let me work that tree. Let me build it. Let me aerate it. Let me fertilize it. Let me show more. And if it's fruitless, then go ahead and destroy it. But you see, the vineyard's desire, the vineyard master's desire, was for that tree to bear fruit. 
That's God's love for us. That's Jesus' love for us. That we would bear fruit for his kingdom. I often say he's a God of grace. He's a God of love. And he's a God of mercy. And he reaches out to you each and every day. If you've never truly turned your life and trusted in him to be that God of mercy, will you do it today? Let your hearts open. Let the Holy Spirit penetrate them. And let you feel his grace, his love, and his mercy within you. Amen. I always rejoice when I see my northern missionaries come back, including three of them that showed up today, and it is a joy to have them with us. How much does God love you? You know that God loves you. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It matters that your hearts seek Him and turn to Him. It just matters that you come back to him. And in his mercy, time and time and time again, he will receive you. Not that we should err in the same thing all the time, but God knows. God knows us. He knows our fallibility. And he never, never forsakes us. The joy of Lent is knowing that when we recognize the inside and turn it over to God, he sends his Holy Spirit upon us to help strengthen us, to help us to seek him. Don't miss out, because God loves you. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen us in his service. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill our soul. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. From the beginning of time to the end of time. From the beginning of time to eternity. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and his reign shall be forever. Our going forth him today, let us stand and boldly sing, Jesus shall reign.